Hi, this is Joe Chambers. Welcome to Musicians Hall of Fame Backstage, The Vault Series. This is part two of a two-part interview we did with L.A. session musician Louis Shelton. Hope you enjoy it. If you do, be sure to hit like, subscribe, and the notification bell so you don't miss any of our new content. And for those of you who can help, we now have a Patreon account, too. Hope you enjoy it. Louis Shelton. I was born in Little Rock, Arkansas, and uh, I played around there until 1958, and that's where I met Reggie Young, who you know, this is the Nashville session player, and played on Elvis's stuff and all that. Uh, Reggie was the one that told me about Johnny Smith and Wes Montgomery and Barney Kessel that sort of expanded my, uh, you know, uh, arsenal of, of guitar players that I could learn from. Uh, I left Little Rock in 58 uh, with a steel player, uh, Leroy Brandon. We took a, a job in Santa Fe, New Mexico. I was 17 years old at the time. We took a six night a week club gig in Santa Fe. And uh, I ended up staying there uh, for uh, around four years, but it was Santa Fe, Albuquerque, Denver, Flagstaff, around the Southwest, different, different gigs. And uh, when I was 21, I said, well, it's, you know, it's time to go to L.A. So I basically packed up, headed west, landed in L.A., and uh, the only person I knew out there was Glenn Campbell because he had been playing in a band up the street from me at, in, in Albuquerque. He was at the, the hitching post and I was down at the Chesterfield and, and we, we became friends during that time. So uh, actually when Glenn left and went out to LA, his drummer joined my band. So the two of us went out to LA together and stayed with Glenn for a few days till we got our bearing and, and found a place to stay and all of that. Glenn took me around and he took me to a Ricky Nelson session and I got to meet James Burton and Joe Osborne. That was the first time I met those guys. And uh, so I, uh, I had to take a road gig when I first got to LA because you don't just go out there and go straight into the studio. You, you somehow got to work your way in over a period of time. Uh, so I had to, I took a gig with Joe and Eddie, a couple of uh, folk, a folk duo, uh, they were from Berkeley, really good, great guys. They were doing a lot of the national TV shows and we did a lot of concert tours uh, at the, to the, you know, universities around uh, the states. We played Basin Street East in New York and the cellar door in Washington, D.C. Uh, we played Chicago, played Toronto, and, and every place in between. And uh, so I did that for two years, in and out of L.A. Then I, uh, I took a club gig with Seals and Crofts, although they weren't Seals and Crofts at that time. They had just gotten out of the band called The Champs, and uh, they needed a guitar player, so I joined them. And, and we played in the clubs around L.A. for, for about a year. And, uh, and then uh, we got booked into Las Vegas. And uh, we actually played in Vegas for about two years. And during that time, I was coming back and forth to LA and doing sessions with Boyce and Hart. And uh, when they finally got the, the job to write for the Monkees TV show, they showed up one night in, in the casino and said, you know, we really got this great deal for a TV show and we want you to come play guitar with us. So I pretty much packed up and, and left Las Vegas and uh, went to LA, we did that. And, uh, and, and by that time, uh, by the time Last Train, uh, Last Train to Clarksville became a number one hit, that was my foot in the door for sessions in LA. And at that time I was in, you know, I was just, I just stayed there and that was all I did for the next, uh, you know, I don't know how long, how many years until I started producing and then I phased out of, of session work. But it, what, what was the first, I mean, was it Seals and Crofts? Uh, the first, 
production I did was uh, for England Dan and John Ford Coley. Uh, they had been out in L.A. shopping for a record deal, and, uh, and they were about ready to go back to Texas. And uh, I said, well, I'm working with Herb Alpert tomorrow. I will take your tape and play it for him, which I did. And, and he said, I really like it, and I want you to produce it. And, and so that was my first production for A&M Records. I did two albums with them there on A&M Records. In the meantime, Seals and Crofts had sort of become Seals and Crofts. They were writing those tunes that they later became famous for. And they had actually recorded two albums as well. And I had played on one, uh, I played bass on, on their second album. And by their third album, their manager came and asked if I would be interested in producing their next album, and that's when I got involved. Uh, and that's when we came up with the hits Summer Breeze and Diamond Girl and We May Never Pass This Way Again and Get Closer, Hummingbird. Uh, I think I did 12 albums with them over the course of the next 15 years. So it's quite a long run. Sing it. Those songs you did? Well, pretty much Jimmy Seals was, was the main writer, but he wrote everything. Uh, they, uh, Seals and Crofts uh, basically wrote all of their material. Later on, we did a couple of outside tunes. Uh, a friend of mine, Mike Simbello, who used to, uh, who still plays guitar for Stevie Wonder. Uh, kept sending me over tunes, and, and we did uh, we did one or two of his tunes, and uh, but other than that, they pretty much wrote all their uh, their songs, yeah, you know, uh, because Jimmy's one of the the best writers I've ever met. Did he write for other artists other than himself? Well, uh, he did. Uh, I mean, he started out as a writer in the early days for Four Star Publishing uh, back when he was with the Champs and all of that. So uh, I don't know if he actually actually ever got any so songs recorded by other people, but uh, he was working on those chops as a writer. And, and the whole time we were together, he was writing songs and stuff. We would, we would do his original songs in our band. Uh, but when he, when he became... Um, a part of Seals and Crofts, and they developed that concept. He his, he started writing different. You know, it was a real unique style of writing and songs that he came up with. That with with the way Dash would put his harmonies with with those songs and and the instrumentation. You know, Dash on the mandolin and Jimmy on the acoustic. Uh, they sort of developed a, a unique sound. And so his writing was primarily for Seals and Crofts at that point. Really, I mean, I, the, the melodies and everything and the hook lines and those songs, but the, really, I, to your credit, the productions, I think, really uh, uh, were, the, were the strong point other than their harmonies. I would, the lyrical content was kind of sketchy uh -huh. to, to me. Yeah. Except for, you know, when I think everybody can relate to Summer Breeze makes me feel fine. Uh -huh. But other than that, you know, it's like a lot of pop songs are, are, are image yeah. driven or something like that. Well, their first two albums were kind of folky. Uh, and, I mean, if you've said, well, what, what category does that fit into? It's had a softness to it. And 
I had, you know, remember been doing sessions all this time, and I decided to take them from A and M, which was more of a softer kind of recording facility, over to the sound factory where I'd worked on the Motown stuff with Dave Hassinger as engineer. Uh, I took them over there to record the Summer Breeze and Diamond Girl albums, and we got a bit more punch into the drums, and, and their songs took on a different feel and life. Plus, uh, during my, my time as a session musician, I was used to different drummers and bass players and combinations of those. So depending on what the song called for, I knew exactly which drummer to call that would play that song the best. Um, and we used, you know, uh, Jeff Beccaro, uh Hal Blaine, Jim Gordon, Jim Keltner, and Victor Feldman on percussion, who we, we you inducted the other night in the Hall of Fame. Uh, there were some, you know, great percussionists that we used. Uh, we used David Page on the piano for Diamond Girl. Uh, that was pre. Toto days. Um, we used Wilton Felder, the famous bass player that you know worked on the uh, the Motown stuff, as well as being the sax player for the Jazz Crusaders. He played on Diamond Girl. Uh, I mean, there was just so many great musicians there that uh, we were able to call upon, and uh, just made it fantastic recording in L.A. at that time. When I first started doing the session work, uh, Glenn had just phased out of session work and he had his hit with By the Time I Get to Phoenix. And shortly after that, uh, he got a, uh, the Glenn Campbell Good Time Hour. And uh, I was fortunate enough to, to get called to work on that show for two years, and uh, which was a lot of fun. Uh, the conductor was Marty Page, David Page's father. Marty also did the arrangements for the big Ray Charles uh, country albums and those big hits that Ray Charles had back then, as well as a lot of other things. And there were great players in that band. Uh, Jeff Picaro's dad was playing percussion, uh, Joe Picaro. We had Tom Scott on sax and, you know, a lot of great horn players in the band. And also at that time I was doing the early Bill Cosby shows uh, with Quincy Jones and that was a lot of fun. Uh, and we were doing the Partridge Family. We, from the very first, uh, very first recording of the Partridge Family, I did all of their stuff. And, and then doing the Monkey stuff. So I was actually doing four TV shows at one time along with all the the record sessions in between, so it was a busy time. The TV shows were fun because um, we'd do those over at uh, CBS, most of them, and it was a big complex. And uh, as a kid from Arkansas, I was still uh, excited every time I'd run into some big star out in the hall, you know, whether it was Sonny and Cher or Jack Benny or Red Skelton these people, their shows were going, gone, going on back in those days. And I've actually gotten in, in, into the elevator, and the only two people in there would be me and Jack Benny. And I, you know, all my life I'd, you know, watched him on TV, and you just don't even know what to say. You don't want to act stupid. And, you, you, and that's a, I tried to act natural and just, hi, how are you, you know, nice, nice day, huh? Yeah. <laughs> and inside, you know, I think, God, that's Jack Benny. <laughs> So that was fun. That yeah, when they were Roy Orbison. Yeah. There, yeah. Like, <laughs> dang. <laughs> yeah. Here in Nashville. Yeah. Were you playing guitar? Were you writing scores? Were you? I was always just a guitar player, the guitar player on the show, on those shows. I was doing the lead guitar uh, on most of those shows, or rhythm, whatever, it, whatever it called for. But yeah, I was just pretty much. In, in the band, one of the band members. Do they the have the music band. written out for you? Uh, not really, th not for a guitar. I mean, they had chord charts and, and a road map, uh, but they didn't have notes written out like they did for the strings and horns, you know. They just pretty much never did that for guitars in L.A. They, 
expect you to play the right thing. Yeah. What about, I mean, was, so was most of that stuff actually done live? Or was it lip-sync? Well, it was, what's, no, it was, uh, it was pre-recorded to a live audience eventually. I mean, sometimes we'd rehearse them for two days and then we'd record the show uh, with the audience. I mean, the music, though. The oh, the music? Yeah. Well, it was going down when we were, while the audience is there, we were playing. We were playing, you so, know. So the, so the people singing were actually singing? Yeah, songs. yeah, yeah, it was live. All that was live, yeah. Uh, yeah, it was the real deal. Mistakes and all. How did you do session work in TV shows? Well, it was it was just a matter of scheduling. Um, you know, whoever called you first, except like with the Campbell show, I knew every week uh, that uh, there were certain times we were going to be working on the Campbell show, so I wouldn't take sessions during that. That was sort of like, you know, a permanent thing. Uh, the Partridge family and the monkeys and Cosby was was more. Uh, it wasn't it wasn't to a schedule. Um, it just depended on when they needed music, and and all. But it, it wasn't like they locked you in for a nine month period, whereas the Campbell show you knew that was every week, and live and and so it was always a you know, first come, first serve, and uh, uh, a lot of people would call and and say, "Are you? Can you do a two two a.m. session next Tuesday?" And if you say, "Well, no, I'm already booked," most of the time they'd try to say, "Well, can you get out of it? Can you send a sub or whatever?" And I said, "No, sorry, I can't." If they really wanted you, they would move their session to accommodate when you were available, but otherwise. You just put them in your book as they came in, and that's that was your schedule for the week or over the you know. We used to book like a month in advance for a lot of of our recording work. The story you told me the other day about the your when you started doing production and then you uh, you had your first check come in. Oh yeah. And you, but you didn't live there anymore. Or whatever. Yeah. When I when I started doing session work, uh, it was you might say a really good pay rise from the six night a week club gig, but still it was just a basically an hourly wage in a sense, although you were paid for a three hour clump of time. But when I started producing, all of a sudden you're on a percentage, so. Uh, if the record sells a lot, you make a lot of money. If it doesn't sell anything, you don't make any money. That's the way that works. And I remember uh, the first check that I ever got was, uh, I got a phone call one day from, from a company that, that had moved in to the uh, offices where Seals and Crofts management had previously been. and. They said, are you Louis Shelton? I said, yeah. And they said, well, we have some mail for you here that you might want to come by and pick up. And I said, oh, well, just forward it on to me. And they said, well, there's a check here, you know, that's, you might want to come pick it up. It's a pretty big check. And this is, this is back in like 1969. And um, I said, really, how much is it? And they said, it's $125,000. Well. I couldn't get down there quick enough because I'd never seen $125,000 in my life. I mean, I paid 40000 for my house back then. So that was my first royalty check. And uh, so, again, it's when you go into production and get on a percentage thing, whether you're a songwriter or a producer or a recording artist, you know, it can be a pay rise if it's, if it's successful. <laughs> Speaking of house, did doing all these sessions there in L.A. and Hollywood, mainly mm -hmm. Hollywood, right? yeah, Burbank, uh -huh. Hollywood. Um, where did you live at? 
Well, my first 10 years in Hollywood, I was on Fountain Avenue, which was uh, two blocks off Sunset. It runs parallel to Sunset Boulevard, and I was two blocks from La Brea, which is where A&M Records was. And uh, so to start the day, if I had a session at A&M, I was in good shape because I was only four blocks from there. If it was a Motown session, I had to kind of drive through Hollywood a bit over closer to Hollywood Boulevard. Uh, but back in those days, traffic wasn't as bad as it, as it is today, so we'd go all over town. You know, you, you could pretty much get from any session to the next one within that hour break that you had. Uh, I wouldn't want to try that today in today's traffic. Uh, you'd be late on most of your record dates, I think. But we lived right in Hollywood for the first 10 years, and... Um, then I bought a house over in the Los Feliz area, close to Griffith Park, uh, which was a, a, a beautiful area, and it was st still pretty close to Hollywood. But after we uh, had had the success with Seals and Crofts, we built a big studio out in the valley. And uh, so I, I, I moved out into the valley so I could be close to that studio because for the next several years, that's where we worked every day, was in our own studio. So we, we got completely out of the traffic scene over into San Fernando Valley. So that, that was really nice. And you pretty much had stopped doing session work? I had stopped doing session work uh, as, 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 as far as taking all calls that came in. But once in a while, I would get a session, uh, a call for a session this sounded like it would be a lot of fun, and I would go ahead and take that one. And, uh, you know, I mean, there were times, I wasn't producing all the time, so there were periods of time when I could, you know, uh, do whatever I wanted to do. And that was the case when we did the Boss Gags album, uh, the Silk Degrees album. Uh, I just happened to be available, and David Page called and said, we're going to do this record with... Uh, Boss Gags, and it's going to be Jeff Vaccaro, myself, and David Hungate. You want to do it? I said, yeah. And uh, that turned out to be one of my favorite all-time uh, records that I made with anyone. Uh, and then, uh, you know, if I got a call to work with someone that I'd never worked with, like Joe Cocker, who I'd been a fan of for many years, uh, I got a call to, when he did that... Uh, up Where We Belong, uh, Joe Cockerford and Jennifer, Warren, Jennifer Warren's for that movie, Officer and a Gentleman. Uh, I ran down and played on that because I, you know, was a big fan of his and I, I hadn't worked with him before. So I did that one. And then uh, I heard about uh, Arista had signed this great singer, Whitney Houston, and we were making her first record. And they had called me up and said, well, I come play on that. And I said, yeah. Sure, and uh, and that was probably the only session I did that year, but uh, I, I I did something every year other than just my own stuff. You know that I I always got out and played on other people's stuff. You know a bit. How often were the artists <clears throat> actually in the studio, the singers? Yeah. I, I mean, was there like were the monkeys the vocalist? in the studio when you were doing the tracks? Well, when we did the Monkees, uh, they were off filming their TV show during the day and we were cutting the tracks. So uh, Boyce and Hart would give us a guide vocal and then the Monkees would come in later and do their vocals. Uh, other artists that were always there, uh, like Neil Diamond was always there, being the writer of his songs. He was the only one that knew how they went. Uh, the Carpenters were always there. Karen was always giving us a beautiful vocal. I mean, most of the time you could release that guide vocal because it was so perfect. Uh, almost all of the Motown sessions, the artist was never there. It was just the writers and producers, except um, when I worked for uh, Marvin Gaye, he was producing his own session, and so he was there. And which was was uh, exciting for me. I was a big fan of his, so it was nice that he was there. 
on the uh, Boss Gags. Uh -huh. <clears throat> Was that you doing the lead guitar riff on Dirty Low Down? Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. Uh, low Down was. Uh, it was just one of those tunes that you just had to count it off, and everybody just fell into a groove. And you know, I had some kind of distortion box there, and they, when they pointed at me, I just went into some, you know, solo lines and stuff, and and that record just sort of made itself. You well, know. That riff, that was one of those. There, there again, though, to me, <clears throat> as a guitar player, somewhat, um, th that was a very melodic memorable, infectious riff that most, even if you didn't play, the um, mm -hmm. listener would know after hearing the song, that would be a very intricate part of the melody. Yeah. Well, you know. I mean, that, 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 just that first. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, when you hear something a thousand times, it, does, it sort of becomes part of it. <laughs> but. Obviously, it must have worked from the beginning because they kept it in and and it did become part of the record. It's just like the solo on Hello. I've, I've heard people say that without the guitar solo, it wouldn't be the same record. As a matter of fact, uh, a couple of weeks ago, one of the Wiggles is doing a solo album and he's doing a solo, uh, an album of, of cover songs and he did Hello and they called me down uh, to the studio to play that solo on it because it just wasn't working without that solo, so. Can, can you do a little, just a little of it? Uh, let's see. Something like that. <laughs> and and uh, just for, so for me here, uh, what's that Boss Gags? At, at the, oh, the, the lead riff. Something wow. like that. <laughs> and, see, I just you just took me back to this <laughs> nightclub that we were playing in and play that every at least once every night. It's a favorite. Yeah. <laughs> to this day. Anywhere we're at if we play that tune, people are into it. <laughs> and, and it still amazes me that, that I mean, as many of these interviews and great players that you just did that riff, you know off the top of your head like that. It's amazing. Well, I still practice. <laughs> I still play a lot. I play every day. No, I mean creating it. Oh, creating it. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's all. It's really, uh, you could almost say improvising because it's spontaneous and I never, uh, when I'm doing a solo, I never play the melody of the song as a solo. I just come up with s something that's totally improvised, and most of the time it seems to work. Reggie, um, speaking of Reggie Young, mm -hmm. he was telling me that um, he, he did a uh, uh, W. Gray um, song, Drift Away. Yeah. And Dobie called him and said, hey, I need you to do a, come do a, a tour with me. Uh -huh. And um, Reggie's like, uh, okay. He said, then I had to go buy the album and learn the stuff that I had played on the record. Uh -huh. Because it was just like, mm, okay, uh -huh. it's on record, next. 
and he couldn't remember it. Uh -huh. He had to go back and relearn it. Yeah. I think that's just amazing. Yeah. Well, actually, uh, I did when I did the solo on Hello, uh, that was, I, they brought me in after they had recorded that track, so I'd never played that song. The only time you hear my guitar is on that solo. And like 10 years later, I'm at a party and there's a singer there and they say, can you play Hello? And I just thought, well, was, I should be able to, but I'm, there was, and I remember, I kind of knew it by ear, uh, uh, but there was one one part where there there was a weird chord. Uh, uh, you see? See, I didn't, I didn't know what that chord. So I sort of played it off the top of my head, but I kind of cringe when it, when I get. Because that's not a, a chord that, you know, you, you just can go to normally like um, like any normal three chord tune. So I lucked out that I was able to, okay, it's augmented chord. And, uh, but I didn't want to look like a fool since I'd played on the record and said, uh, so uh, now I know all the chords to the song. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I've had to go back uh, you know, like even the last train to Clarksville, I wouldn't have played that song ever again after uh, that record date uh, and, until like 30 years later. Uh, I started go out and doing live stuff and, and as part of that, I'd do a medley of the hits I played on. And I sort of had to say, what did I do there, you know, on that solo? I had to sort of go back and rethink it and figure out what I did on that on that stuff. That's one thing I was, I was going to ask you that, uh, and that was one of those questions I forgot. Was did you ever go out and play with like Reggie did with um, with the artists that you had recorded with? The only ones I ever went out with was Seals and Crofts. Uh, whenever they like they did Carnegie Hall. And, and some uh, really big concerts in you know, like Chicago and some of those places. And uh, I would go do those with them. But for, for most of their touring, they had a band that would go with them and I would stay in LA and was still doing other stuff. But on special occasions, I would go uh, uh, play with them. Uh, I. I played with Glenn when he, Glenn Campbell, when he came down to Australia, just as an old friendship thing, you know. Me and Larry Mahoberak, a keyboard player that lives down in Australia as well. Uh, but I never went out with, you know, Boss Gags or, or anyone else that I can think of and actually played, uh, you know, did a tour or anything like that. It'd be fun. I might do it before it's over with. <laughs> Yeah, I would enjoy that. Do you, um, was there a, fa a, a favorite period of, a favorite year or a favorite period of time that you'd like to revisit again or well, you just remember fondly? Th there were several years there that I would like to relive again. Uh, and I could probably go, go way back for, for that request. Uh, but uh, I think when I, when I finally broke the session scene over the course of the next two years, it, it was a, a just every day was a thrill. You just had to pinch yourself and say, oh my, I get to go record again today. And this is who I'm going to record with today. The mamas and papas are, you know, 
or whoever. Uh, that was a, a very, a very happy period, you know. And we were making good records. By that I mean people were writing good songs, and we we had great artists we were working with, and and it was fun being a part of that. And very lucky to be there at that time when when the, those great artists and songs were being made, uh, working out the parts on "I Want You Back" and. Uh, coming up with a little fuzz tone on ABC. You know, it sounds simple, but uh, there weren't a lot of fuzz tones coming out of the LA studios at that time. It was like the first record you heard it on. And I was one of the first guys to actually have a wah-wah pedal and a, and a, a distortion pedal in the session scene. So I, I tried to click them on whenever I could and get away with it. And that was the very first time I ever had, had them let me play on a a distortion box on a record. <laughs> and it worked, you know. What, what were the studios that you frequented the most in L.A. during those periods? Period? Uh, well, Sunset Sound uh, on Sunset Boulevard, uh, Western United, they were also on Sunset Boulevard. Uh, we did the Partridge family there. Uh, we did uh, probably a lot of the monkey stuff there. Uh, RCA had a big studio at the time that it no, lo no longer exists. A lot of great records were made there. Uh, Columbia Studios had a, had, a, had a lot of, that's where we worked with Mark Lindsay and, and the Raiders, uh, Andy Williams, uh, all of the Columbia artists uh, that we used to record uh, was over at Columbia. Uh, the Sound Factory uh, is where we did Summer Breeze. It's where we did the Jackson Five first first sessions. Anyway, eventually I think Motown opened up their own studio. We did the the Jackson Five and Seals and Crops there, and James Taylor and Linda Ronstadt also recorded there. What, what address was where was that located? That was a block off of Hollywood Boulevard. And I think it was Wil Wilcox or Coanga, one of those was the cross street. But it was a block, Selma, it was on Selma, which ran one block parallel to Hollywood Boulevard, right downtown Hollywood. Uh, it's kind of a small studio, you know, one room. Uh, you know, we had the drums and piano, guitars all out in the same little room, and uh, blankets on the piano. and. The guitar players had to plug into a direct box. We couldn't record with the amp on because we didn't want any leakage into the drums. And so that's the way those Motown records were made. It's amazing. I want you back. That's all straight into a direct box with a telly. Uh, and uh, I thought it sounded horrible, but the records sound OK. <laughs> but I didn't like recording that way. Well, uh, you know, that's Barry Gordy did it like that up in uh, in Detroit too, pretty much. He had, they had one amplifier, uh -huh. and it was a homemade amp, uh -huh. and it had five inputs, volume, and a VU meter. Oh my God! That was it. Uh -huh. Bass guitar, rhythm, rhythm lead. Unbelievable. All, all in the same little amp, so they would all sit, just you know, right up next to each other, uh -huh. and and of course that was only for them yeah. to monitor themselves. Uh huh. Barry did everything in the control room as far as sweetening it. Yeah, I'll be done. Yeah, not a very fun way to record for guitar players. Uh, then we had the record plant. Uh, it was a great studio. But uh, yeah, A&M was one of my favorites. Uh, that was a beautiful complex. They had, that's where Carole King uh, recorded uh, the Tapestry album. It was owned by Herb Alpert and Jerry Moss. Um, it was an old film studio, so it had a big sound stage there. It had Studio A, B, and C. Um, and I used that studio for a lot of my first recordings anyway, uh, and did a lot of sessions there. It's where we did the Carpenters, you know, uh, a great facility. That's where I did the John Lennon session. Yeah, with uh, Phil Spector producing, and uh, which is a story all in itself. But uh, 
Uh, no, it was a great facility, one of my favorite. That's where I started producing and, and sort of getting my hands on the control knobs of things. So that was special. How, how did you enjoy doing the working with John Lennon? Uh, well, it was, it was a great pleasure meeting him because I was such a big fan of the Beatles. And it was one of those times where you, you kind of say to yourself, well, may, maybe I've, I've really made it because I'm actually working with John Lennon. Um, and uh, the reason I, I got to do that was Jim Keltner, the famous drummer, uh, who's a friend of mine I worked with quite a bit, recommended me for this session. And uh, it was a session where we were uh, covering some song that had, had been done on the Stax record label, some old song. I don't even know what it was. Uh, they had a 45 of it that they played us, no charts, and we just sort of worked it out there uh, and, and uh, did that particular recording. And Phil Spector was being his typical what he was noted for, you know. We had so much sound and reverb in our phones, we couldn't even hear one another, you know. Uh, that was just his way of, of working. It's getting all of the reverbs going and all of this ocean of sound in your phones. Um, and uh, I probably shouldn't say too much about that session. I might get sued, but it was, it was quite... Uh, I wish somebody would have filmed it. <laughs> it was quite an experience. John was fine, though. John, it was great working with John. Hal was on that session. Yeah, Hal Blaine. And uh, Dr. John was on keyboards. And uh, Jim Horn was on it, one of our friends here. That's the Pussycat? Was that the Pussycat record uh, or session? Or? Oh, I don't know what it was. I think that's what Jim said. Yeah? Maybe, maybe that was another one. Yeah, know. yeah, it might have been another one. He probably played on more than I did. That was the only one I played on. I have, I have tracked it down on the internet before, but I didn't write down what it was, so I'd have to go find it again. That's the way I found out, I find out what I've done is I go on the internet and look and see, because I, I've never kept track of any of that stuff, really. Uh, I had a box of, of record album covers that someone sent me last week of over 50-something uh, album covers. And half of them, I didn't even, I didn't even believe I played on them until I turned it over and saw my name on the back because I didn't remember them, you know, unless it was like a major name that I recognized. But for every hit record that we played on, we would have played on a hundred others that didn't make a hit. So, I mean, uh, you forget about so much of that stuff. Well, that's kind of what we were talking about the other day. What you've got in your hand is was a tool. Yeah. And you went to work every day. Uh -huh. Granted, it was a great job. Yeah. But it's just like anybody that, that goes to work with a with a shovel or a hammer or whatever. Yeah. I doubt seriously they remember every building they worked on or yeah. every house, whatever. Yeah. No, you uh when you're working that fast and frequently, uh, on different different tunes, unless it's something that ends up that you're hearing on the radio for the next 30 years, you're, you're likely to, to forget what it was. As a matter of fact, uh, I, I played on the first Michael McDonald album, but at that time Michael wasn't known. It was before the Doobie Brothers. And 15 years later, uh, Larry Carlton, I was talking to Larry, and he said, you remember that session we did over at A&M and What's His Name was producing, and that piano player, that quiet guy? That was Michael McDonald. I said, you're kidding. Yeah. So I wouldn't even, I uh, still wouldn't have known that I'd played on a Michael McDonald's first record unless Larry had found it out and reminded me 15 years later. <laughs> well, I can't, a lot of the guys said that uh, they didn't even know, and this is common, Motown to Nat, uh, uh, New York especially, and, and the song was like number 13, and that was all you knew. The singers weren't there. You didn't even know who it was. Uh -huh. And um, 
and then when you or even the Beach Boys uh, a lot of the guys didn't know what song they were playing until they heard it some months later on the radio and they went oh yeah. that's it you know yeah so, and well, I don't know how you could do that I just I don't understand it well like for example with the Motown stuff they they all they always had an arranger there uh, and mostly it was the bass part and key, keyboard part, but it was pretty much a roadmap for the guitar players and the drummers. Uh, but sometimes during that one session, if you ask who, who's this song for, they might say Smokey Robinson, and you go for the next tune, you get that one done, you say, well, who's this for? Oh, that's Thelma Houston or, or you know, one of the other artists. So you might be playing on three different Motown artists on the same session, and since they're not singing it, you wouldn't know really until you heard it on the radio who actually finally sang that song. Uh, other than, you know, like the Jackson 5, their stuff was pretty memorable because we worked so hard on working out the parts and all of that, even though they weren't there. We worked pretty hard on those tracks to get them, you know, the way they were. So we remembered those. <laughs> I forget who it was that told me, but um, one of the guys told me that they they did know they were doing Jackson Five because that was the one chart that would have Jackson or something like that written yeah. on the top uh -huh. right corner. Yeah. But, but the rest of it, they didn't really know. Yeah. I always usually ask if there's anything that, that you'd like to tell somebody coming up that wants to do what you did. Uh huh. And that you can just. Talk to the camera on this one. Okay, well, um, any, any young players coming up, um, uh, my, my advice would to be uh, learn as many different styles of, of playing as you can. And I'm, 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 I guess I'm mainly talking about guitar players because uh, those are the guys that would be interested in what I do. Um, a lot of us players, uh, whether it's Eric Clapton or, or, or Jimmy Page or Larry Carlton um, or myself, uh, really had a good uh, base and understanding of blues. And I think that, that holds true even, with, even if you're a sax player. If you're a sax player that had a good base in blues and then you decide you, know, you want to go to jazz, I think it makes a better player out of you. Um, and I can only say that when I saw Jimi Hendrix live at the Hollywood Bowl, I mean, we all knew that he was a good blues player, but I didn't really know how good he was until I saw him live and how much blues he actually played on the show. And uh, so I, I, I emphasize getting that, you know, listening to the, the, the original guys at, you know, the B.B. Kings, and I was fortunate enough to, to play on the, T-Bone Walker's last album, and that was one of the highlights of my career because he, he passed away a couple of years after that, and I was glad that I had the opportunity to work with him. But uh, along with your, your rock and roll and your, your country or whatever you do, uh, be sure and listen to him and get, get the blues because there's something that's sort of ground zero there that, that you can carry through your whole uh, music life. Uh, that, that just, just puts the soul into whatever you do.